Hello, screenwriters, and welcome to Writing for Screens. I have thoughts. Today's topic is automating and optimizing art. Can you do this? Should you do this? What happens when you do this? Just some random thoughts. My name is Glenn Gers. I am the organizing principal behind Writing for Screens, and I come to you every Tuesday and Thursday live at 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time Zone, if I can make it, to do random, uh, not random, <laughs> assorted, various um, writing classes live, and also to be here to answer questions and, and get into to back and forth with those of you who are live with me. Um, but the main thing I do here at Writing for Screens is on the channel itself. This is a screen grab of my channel page, which I am doing to show you that down at the bottom of that, there's some playlists. Those playlists, the first three playlists on my channel, Screenwriting Essentials, Screenwriting Tools, Skills, and Craft, and The Process, Being a Writer, these are where I have put the goods, the best, the most useful small videos each one of these videos is a 10-minute lesson on a particular type uh, topic related to writing and especially screenwriting. The name of that topic, the subject, will be in the thumbnail. You cannot miss it. If you just want to browse those thumbnails, you will say, oh, genre, flashbacks, action. Um, and, and if you were to watch that 10-minute lesson, I try to condense down as many practical tips, tools, observations, insights that I can into the simplest, most useful form I know from things I have taught myself in the past 25 years working in TV and movies uh, on my way out of the industry. I thought I would leave behind for y'all those things I had to teach myself so that you don't have to teach yourself and you can get right to work. Let's say some quick hellos. Hi, Kirby Light and 99 Precinct and Larry and Gig. Hello, Christian Koenig and Nathan. Good to see all of you. It is so great to have you here for this little I Have Thoughts discussion. Um, uh, yeah, so this is the thing. I now have a running series, which I'm calling I Have Thoughts, because it is just that. It is not a definitive lesson. It is a, a bunch of what I'm thinking about a topic that either was provoked by an incident in the real world, an article or somewhat, or a question that a lot of people have asked me. A lot of people have asked me about AI, writing and AI. So that's one of the things I want to talk about. Hey, Doug, thank you for being here. That actually makes it fun for all of us. Um, and I really appreciate it. If, if nobody was watching these, I would stop doing them. Hi, Gene. Uh, hello, Dr. Gonzo. We doing all right. Ever stay. Hi, hi. Very nice to meet you. I don't believe we have ever communicated. Anyway, let's get to it. Uh, the question, the first question, uh, the question I get asked a lot uh, is, what do you think about AI? Is AI going to change writing? Is AI going to take our jobs? Is AI, what's happening with AI? Um, I, I don't think you have to worry too much about AI, but I do actually believe that there's a related question, which is uh, another technological um, uh, approach called optimizing. That actually is a big worry. Um, so I'm going to discuss those two things, give my thoughts on that. Please feel free to chime in with yours or with questions. I am here for the next hour to do this. Let's first talk um, about the, the basic issue of AI, of automating art, um, because the first question is, why? What, what's the advantage? What do you gain from having a computer do art instead of a person? Uh, because that's what we're talking about. Um, uh, one of the main things to think about, what does it mean to have AI do art? Um, why would you want a computer to do art instead of a person? Let's talk about why you would automate anything, why you would turn over um, uh, human activities to a machine. Um, the, the first reason, or the original industrial reason, was physical labor. Like if you could get a machine that could do the work that was really hard and unpleasant, to usually do it faster or stronger, that's a good reason to automate something. Also, routine tasks. If you have to wrap 200 boxes and you've got a machine that can just do it, 
that's a good thing to automate. Don't make a person do that. Um, also, uh, if one of the things that, that came up with automation in the beginnings of automation um, at the beginning of the 20th century um, was that you could produce more or faster or cheaper of a thing, like a factory work. That was a way to automate. You could say, okay, we can get 200 cars made uh, when uh, it used to take us a week to do one. So that's good. And there are pieces of work, types of work that machines do better, uh, sometimes more consistently, like a lot of, of types of labor that are, you know, okay, if you want to, if you want to have something, uh, you know, deposit two milliliters of a fluid into a bottle, probably a machine will do it better than a person. So those are good reasons to automate. None of those really makes sense for art. <laughs> I cannot think of a good reason to automate art. Um, yes, ChatGPT certainly has has brought up this. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, the, the complications of, of uh, I will get into, the complications of AI writing are partly that, yes, they, they're pulling from other people's work. Um, but the main thing is, what is the advantage of doing it? For instance, if you are doing some kind of like apparently writing legal contracts, um, there are a large number of standard legal contracts. That's actually a good use of an AI, it seems. I mean, I don't know what it's like to be a paralegal and have to make up a boilerplate contract. Um, but I do know that that's very different from writing a short story or a novel or a video game or anything. Um, so the, the biggest question becomes like exactly where is the art need for this? It, who, who would be gaining, uh, who would you automate the art for, um, the art business? Because a lot of, a lot of automation is done in order to, uh, give advantage to the business. It is easier to have a machine. The machine doesn't require health insurance, um, so that's one reason. Businesses often find it's more efficient or easier to automate things. Um, uh, but for the artist, it's not particularly useful. <laughs> um, to, and the, the question is, does this in some way provide a better product to the audience? Is the audience looking for this? Or is society as a whole saying, gee, what we've really needed is, is more robotic art? Um, I am not... I'm not sure uh, that anyone has ever said that. Hello, Thumper. Um, uh, I don't know what a rubber ducky is, um, but but tell me. Um, so so yeah, the, the the point becomes like for for artists. I and we'll talk about some things you could use AI for. None of it would be actually doing the art work um, for a company that produces regularly written products in screenwriting that would be like a tv show the question would be what if you could get a writing room full of ai so what if you got like five or six ai bots that were each tuned differently you know uh, set up so that they had a different personality or different strengths and weaknesses could they write a tv show um one of the big points about this is at the moment no they couldn't do it even if you wanted them to um they are not capable of creative writing um, that, as far as I know, and certainly the the quality of the creative writing is not uh, at the standard that you would need. Um, so, to, but in theory, from what I understand, AI is advancing far faster than people thought, and so it is not impossible that AI writing could become essentially as good um, as as human writing. Except, this is the question. What does that mean? What does as good mean? Um, I, I, don't, I don't know that anyone's seriously working towards this right now. It's really not the point of AI. AI doing this particular task is really, really just like a little freak show, sideshow thing that people are doing. Um, uh, hold on. Let me just check on Larry and what the rub, rubber ducky is. Rubber duck debugging. Sometimes just t talking the problem out and explaining to someone is if you're telling someone who doesn't know anything about you. Oh, that actually does kind of in some ways make sense. The problem is the, the quality of the responses from the listener might be kind of uh, 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 uncanny valley-ish and useless. In other words, if you say, like if you, it is very possible 
to say, uh, talk through your story. Say, I want to tell this person the story so that uh, I can see whether it is A, gaining any emotional uh, response or interest from them, or B, making sense to them. That's one thing you, you can do often in, in writing is say, let me walk through the story. Let me talk through it with a person. Could you do that with an AI? I'm not sure. I mean, in theory, in theory, if AI is advanced, and once again, we get into this like, well, in theory, if an AI became emotional, <laughs> um, yeah. But, but at the moment, to the question of could an AI say that doesn't make sense? Um, uh, on a pure logic, yeah, maybe, but most stories don't operate on actual pure mathematical logic. They operate on personality logic. They uh, operate on story logic. So therefore, an AI would not be able to detect that. In theory, we, we can, and we'll, we'll talk about this more, in theory, if you fed every story from history into an AI and then said, okay, compare this to that, you would get... Um, the response of, well, most stories don't do that. But once again, in art, is that really how you decide to do things? Do you say, hmm, I want to write a movie. Well, most movies don't do this. Sometimes that's the reason to do it. So that is not a helpful uh, artistic approach, a creative approach. Hello, Morbo. Um, I saw an ad recently for automated blog posts. Um, there was a there was a company selling like apparently <laughs> this is what it seems. I was like, why would you want this? The, the, apparently, companies need blog posts written all the time. I, I'm not sure why, but they do seem to. And then the question would be. Um, why, like, well, if we hate to have some sit person sitting in a cubicle writing these things, why don't we get a computer to do it? The question is, like, if all you're doing is feeding the blog with, with meaningless posts, sure, get in a computer to do it. But the whole point of a blog, literally the point of a blog was you had something to say. <laughs> like, if you don't have something to say, why are you doing this? Um, and the answer is for businesses is they just are trying to attract attention. Um, hello, Axel Larson, and hello, hello, uh, good to know. Um, yes, um, and, and the quality, news articles, indeed. And this is actually one of the problems. <laughs> Very recently, um, an AI uh, in Germany was programmed, I believe it was, it was from a fast food company, I think, I'm not sure, but an AI was programmed... Uh, to respond to calendar events by putting out uh, tweets in which said like, Merry Christmas, try our Christmas lattes or burgers or whatever it was. Uh, and unfortunately in, in uh, Germany, one of the holidays is the Holocaust Remembrance or Kristallnacht, I believe it was. Anyway, the point, it was, it was a bad, it was not something that you go like, oh, happy Kristallnacht. <laughs> it, was, it was something that was like a, 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 a deeply, uh, disturbing Memorial Day and uh, and they said hey it's it's crystal knocked go get our you know our crystal knocked burger or something it was a disaster this is the problem with AI they yeah yes you can make them respond to triggers um, and in theory they will get better at that and say oh let's not do the the, <laughs> the bad ones um, but but overall the, once again the question comes First of all, is that even art? What What is the advantage? What is the point? Um, brief hellos. Hi, Nacho. Hi, Donna. Um, it is great to see you. Um, we're talking about uh, automation and technology and, and art. Um, in theory, you could automate something to be more popular, like as a business um, a, a business plan to say... Uh, and, uh, Often the, the concept is, if I could figure out the secret of what made this piece of art popular, I could copy it. Um, that's an old scheme. That's pre-tech. <laughs> However, the truth is you can't do that. If you could do that, everyone would do it. <laughs> it would be done. Um, <laughs> indeed. Very playa. Exactly. Happy COVID day. Yeah. Hello, Aries. Good to see you. So the, uh, the but another possible thing that a, that an art producer might want would be customized art. 
Um, and this is actually an interesting question. Should art be customized? Like if, if you're saying, well, I want to give the audience what they are looking for, but obviously every art audience member is going to be slightly different. Um, so therefore, like I want to see something about my hometown. Um, the question is, would it be to your advantage to create customized stories or novels to say you plug in the the facts of your life and somebody writes a story that would appeal to you personally um hello this is kitschy um i i don't want to just say trash that because it is kind of an interesting concept but but is that what art is? And once again, this comes down to the basic issue of like, why would you want to do this? The whole point of art is that in theory, it is an expression of a unique individual spirit or person. <laughs> um, and that that is, is communicated to other unique individual persons. If it is just an individual person's wish list created by a machine to feed them, First of all, you're just going to get tired of it really fast because we do look for other things from art. We look for news, originality, surprise, um, pro the provocation of emotions that we have not already had. Um, in which case, um, routinizing art will not work. It simply will no longer function to be art. It will run down very quickly. Um, there is also already a problem with customizing news and opinion and, and social media in that we've rapidly discovered that if all you do is feed people the thing that they already want, it creates extremes, um, which are not good. In other words, if you, if you like a movie with car crashes, pretty soon all you're going to have is uh, two hours of solid car crashes. Um, first of all, that that neg negates the truth of art, which is that it is not all one thing. The other thing that it does is it's a dead end. You know, at a certain point, you'll have seen all every possible type of car crash, and you'll be and most people will be like, you know, I kind of want a rom com, and the you'd have to tell the machine that as soon as you have to do that, the question of art comes back in, which is art is offering you a, a variety, a multiplicity of things. It's not just something that you plug in and, and turn out copies of. Um, well, one of the things that made me think about this was spin art. Um, I don't know if you guys know what spin art is, um, it, it, but uh, the, the question is like, could you use technology to make your art better? Could you run your story through a story processor? to check its quality? Um, and the answer is no, that doesn't work. Um, uh, you can, you do, we all do. I am using technology right now to create this work, this creative work. This class is uh, kind of creative, but certainly um, I am using technology. We all use technology to work art. And it, the question would be, is there a way to use art for that. That's something to, 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 to consider and think about. Um, the, the, the main issue is even when you take something that's relatively, and I, I don't mean this to say in any way that, that uh, visual art is simpler than storytelling art, but, um, but right now AI is able to produce um, uh, like cool art, like you can feed in, like I want to see a duck flying o over, you know, the Eiffel Tower. And there's various uh, open AI programs which will give that to you. Or there's some that will redo your portrait in different historical periods. Um, the problem is that that's essentially a filter. Um, uh, certainly the, the ones that are just applying a known style to a thing. Um, that's not really that different from putting dog noses or ears on your selfies. I mean, that, that runs into a dead end very, very quickly. It's an effect. It's not a creative act. Um, the question would be, um, and let me just quickly take a quick here because the, uh, 
the uh, the chat is is getting is getting into this. AI is good at detecting patterns, but mostly bad with exceptions from patterns. Um, and art is about exceptions at its core. That is what makes it. This is a hundred percent right, Morbo. Um, analog here is chess. A lot of work in AI has been done in chess. Yet no one likes watching chess bots play each other. Uh, the grandmasters have incorporated. It. Yes, well, I mean, there's, they have. There is a personality. Um, AI reuses art, human art. We want human art because it has soul, because it is human. That is entirely true. Um, people, ha I, you see, I don't know enough about chess to know about this, but I do understand that the chess machines are frighteningly good. Um, the ways to cheat the chess by playing in non-logical ways. That that actually, all of that seems cool, um, and I think does get to to I think one of my. Um, main questions, which is basically, what is creativity? Is AI actually being creative? If you have a, an art engine and you say, I want to do, you know, a portrait of, of George Washington uh, in, in cyberpunk, um, they can do that. Um, but that's just, that's using um, a stockpile of, of basic predetermined images. Um, I was reading about the this guy um, Blake Lemoyne, who was a Google engineer who got fired <laughs> for saying that their dialogue AI, a thing called Lambda, had retained sentience. In other words, it it was a a living uh, thought organism. Um, they, what they said is uh, in this article, Lambda is a machine learning model that has been trained on mountains of text to mimic human conversation by predicting which word would typically come next. That's not human conversation. <laughs> we don't we don't sit there and go, hmm, what would the typical person say in this conversation? <laughs> we, we don't. We respond from ourselves, where there is a unique, at least as far as we can tell, there is such a thing as a unique individual person to each human, and each human therefore responds not with what would the average human say here, they say, what would I say because of what I want? And this is actually where my concept of dramatic action comes in, because the whole point about creative writing or dialogue is no one operates purely out of averaging or logic or anything else. You operate out of your personal need in the moment. Everyone, whenever you speak, um, even if you're just ordering a soda at a counter of a lunch you know, a luncheonette, you are speaking and, and what you are doing is in order to proceed with your personal life in the moment. Um, art is an expression of an individual's feelings, experience, choices, or goal. But here's the question. Does it have to be? Um, I, I really, I urge you all as, as artists to always question your beliefs about art. That's sort of why I'm doing this this hour. Because the question is, well, is art only like it? There was a long period of time when the quest, the point of art was, in fact, to express a, a religious impulse. Or, in fact, there are times when people would say the point of art is to express the the uh, soul or meaning of our group of people, not a person, a group, a a, a tribe, a nation, whatever it is, and to say the purpose of art really should be to to speak that, and that you artists should be trying to tap into that, or 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 we will all get together and decide what that is. Those are all completely legitimate views of art. Art does not have to be individual, but even then, I would argue those things, those tribes, those committees, those national boards are unique individuals in that in that they they form together made out of of, of humans <laughs> um, and and they operate through a series of collaborations and negotiations and power plays um, and intuitions and all sorts of other creative things to create a unique work um, and that is still art um, one of the, the things is people say well when you write, Aren't you just looking through all the words you've learned and all the story ideas and just picking them out like an AI would? It essentially, isn't your brain a computer? 
from what I understand, all good brain researchers say, no, that's not actually how brains work. Brains are not simply computers. Brains are actually far, far more complicated and mysterious than computers. There is much in the brain that the computer model doesn't work out. The, the computer model does not fully explain how brains work. And even if you believe that there is no such thing as a soul or a spirit or an individual, then you would still say the brain is the operating creator, and those are not just plug in, feed out. Um, okay, let me just quickly check out this. Um, I always still feel cynical about AI. It's overhyped like all technologies. Um, well, jetpacks and flying cars are not that far away. <laughs> um, and my, and the, the thing I do want to take seriously is if AI became sentient, if AI did actually, as people say, it may yet, if the singularity happens and an AI becomes as far as we can scientifically and philosophically determine a unique individual, then couldn't it create? My answer would be, yeah, at that point it could. Um, however, A, do, do we want that? Uh, hello, Skynet. And B, um, uh, still, what, I mean, uh, that, that enters a whole philosophical realm, but it does not have anything to do with what we should do as artists. Um, hang on, let me just, I'm just reading some quote, comments here. Strongest AI chess ages cannot be beaten. Um, Yeah, yeah. Like, it would not surprise me. Um, and, and once again, I do not know enough about chess to understand the creative elements of chess. And that's the thing I'm here to talk about. AI has many, many purposes and uses in the world. I'm talking about AI in art, which is a, a unique, I believe, actually a unique creative activity in which the question is, is there a place for AI and what would it do to our understanding of art? Um, so, yeah. Uh, okay, let me just, I'm just trying to keep up with you guys here. The average stockfish at low depth 20 can be beaten right now. You, okay, this is computer chess talk, um, but apparently um, the best computer chess plays really, really well. I would believe that. I do not understand the creative element of chess well enough. Um, but I will say one thing, no matter how creative chess is, one of the reasons that they've been working on AI for chess is that at its ultimate, it still has a limited sphere of influence, a sphere of activity. It's got a board with a very small number of squares, a small number of pieces, and a small number of possible moves. So while a computer may be able to calculate every possible move, that would still not be remotely as complicated as every possible painting, um, let alone every possible story. I believe, actually, paintings and stories, it's possible that there's more complexity to stories than there is to paintings. Not sure, but I would say no matter what, the whole point about, yeah, they automated chess because it's got two sides, a bunch of pieces, a limited number of pieces on a limited number of squares. You, you can work that out. In theory, uh, there's a show called Devs. Uh, I, I should recommend this. This is a good thing. Hold on. Um, there is a TV series, uh, it was on Hulu, called Devs. Um, Devs, it's a, a, like an eight-part series, I think, um, about, uh, about a lot of these issues. Um, and and the, the question of, okay, yeah, what if we could compute at a high enough level to go into these theoretical realms? It's, it's a great uh, tech thriller. Uh, about that issue. Um, but the point is, the amount of computing power that you would need to do what a human brain does um, in order to create a unique piece of art, um, I guess my main thing you want to say would be, why? 
<laughs> like if you could get a computer that could teach, like that could that could do all of that computing to come up with a painting that that my aunt can do in her garage, you know, on a Saturday, um, and and my aunt, by the way, not a painter, um, but but the point is the. To, to organize that when every college and high school in the world, when the IRS is not, is not needs new computers and new computing, why are we not putting the computers towards something useful? <laughs> why would we be doing this? This is just such a dumb use of AI. Um, like until the IRS and the U.S. Postal Service uh, IRS is the American tax system. And and notoriously, one of the problems that the American tax system has is the computers are old. They are outdated and they can't they can't do what we need to do. Likewise, the the police, the FBI, they all need new computers. So why are we doing this and and seeing whether or not we can get a bad painting out of a computer? It just doesn't make any sense to me, even if it's technologically possible. Um, hi, Ray. Uh, <laughs> lunch, luncheonette. Yes, that's that's true. Um, AI is not actually artificial intelligence in the way that we interpret. Yet, that's I was talking theoretically. Um, uh, machine learning, exactly. That that at the moment AI is just really, really advanced computing. <laughs> um, the question is, what happens if an AI can become essentially human and creative? Um, yes, exactly. Thank you, Gregory. Um, the only creativity can be proved with those tools is going to be the filtered or governed by human beings that deciding that it is creative. So we are the editors. Yeah, yeah, we are. We are on the same page, Gregory. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> it's all good. No problem. Um, Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There are supercomputers that can do that. The question is, why are we doing this with those machines? It's like, what is the value of, of like, and suppose, suppose you could get a computer to write a really great novel. Even then, how great would it be? Would it really be worth all of that technology being used for that purpose? Um yeah, there's. I, I'd actually the ethics and legal question of AI is a whole separate one that I'm not going to to get too into. Although I do want to talk about the fact that um, the automated picture making is running into this problem. That automated picture making, um, they are taking other people's artwork, using it as a basis from which to generate new work. That is theoretically copyright infringement and stealing and wrong. Um, so that's a real problem. Also, automated picture making is actually taking away work from humans because um, there is a large market for people to say, I need a picture of. And ordinarily, they would have to hire an artist. They would have to go on to a, a forum which allows you to hire an artist to do an illustration and say, could you do this picture that I need for my book report um, or my blog post or whatever it is that you're doing? That is actually a place where computers are taking away work. Um, and, and that is an ethical and moral and legal problem, which I think is not uh, is, is a giant issue that should be taken on. What's interesting is it doesn't really come up for writers. Um, in theory, it will come up for non like I'm talking about creative writing. Um, if you're writing essays or, or journalism, yes. This is actually already a problem. Somebody could could get an AI to write a news report. Would it be good? No, <laughs> but they, but they are already starting to do that, and that is a big problem. And certainly, as far as students using it to do book reports, it's a big problem. But when it comes to actual storytelling, there isn't really a market for you to say, "Hey, I really need a, a short story. <laughs> can you can you get a computer to make it?" It's just like where would that come up? Who, what is there's like some magazine saying, oh, geez, I don't want to pay people, you know, as much to, to, to do my stories that that's, even if that were happening, it would be on such a small scale. It's just not worth worrying about. Um, 
it's like it's like when people were talking about C- CG actors taking over acting, you know, because they they started to say like, oh, what it happened? I first believe on the sequel to The Crow, where they they computerized Brandon Lee, I think. Anyway, um, and everyone was like, oh my god, what are we going to do? They're, all the actors they're going to stop using real actors. That never happened, and it's unlikely to happen on any large scale. First of all, because it's just harder and more expensive. And more difficult. It's more time. It's so much easier to just get an actor to act than to get a computer program to act for them. Um, and even if, in theory, down the line, that computer program could be made cheaply and easy, like there was a time when it wasn't possible to, to digitize film, and now you can just, it's better. Um, but even then, the act, the computerized actor is not going to act as well as an average person. So there's there's not going to be an an actual deep need or a large market for the taking away creative work from certain types of creative art. Um, the, the, the picture making is a serious problem. Um, in chess, the neural networks taught themselves how to play, unlike old data, yes. Um, the, yeah, from what I understand, there are AI that are self-teaching, there are essentially creative to some extent um, uh, uh, AI able to do human things. Just that's, I'm not, I'm not disputing that. It's like saying, um, yes, another tool. I think that's very true. Uh, like at some point people are like, well, you can't get a robot to do fine tuned stuff. And now actually sometimes you can, robots will do certain fine tuned stuff better than people. Um, so I don't want to say, oh, that'll never happen. I'm talking about a very specific thing, which is creative art. Um, and in that field, I'm having a hard time seeing the point at which it becomes advantageous to anyone to do it. That's not the, I'm not even saying you couldn't do it. I'm saying, why would you bother? Um, but I do want to, I want to switch now to the question that is affecting all of us, and it's affecting us now, which is optimizing. Um, you know, that's true, except um, that rapidly runs into the financial end, which is, yes, it can be done. And, you know, somebody might say, OK, I'm going to prove the value of my computer by having it write a short story. And then having done that, they're not going to find a mass market of story hungry people who are like, yeah, I'm going to just make that, you know, it, at very best, it would be like those, you know, those those greeting cards where you put somebody's face in and then it does a little dance to a little pre-recorded music. Yeah, yes, you might customize art so that you could have like, here, here's a little Western short story with my my grandmother who loves old Westerns and I put her name and, and personality into the story. How big a market is that? How big a use is that of this technology? It, it's it, it it can be done, but that's there are many things that technology can be done that they don't do because there isn't a market for it. Um, my fear in terms of stories being done this way is bonehead executives. Yes, that's what I want to get to, um, uh, because I know that they are doing that. Um, uh, yes, exactly. The idea that that and I promise you, there are many companies in in the entertainment industry are there desperately looking into this. They're trying to figure out ways, not so much to create rough drafts, although maybe they will eventually do that. Um, but once again, this is just one of those things that is just easier to find a writer. <laughs> um, but uh, but the big thing about this is that there are things where they are using AI to judge writing. They're saying, here, run this screenplay through the AI and see if it hits our, you know, these are commercial elements. Um, that is already happening. I know that Netflix was has been trying to, A, figure out a way to judge creative work uh, uh, through automation. And also, can they, they, they've explored the question of what if we could automate creating our shows? Um, they have not been successful with that. As far as I know, that division is not doing well. Um, hey, fatherhood, good to see you. We are. My point is we are not being replaced by AI, but we may be badly damaged by uh, optimization. Um, <laughs> yeah, and there is also the problem of, of just, you know, how much computing powder do you need to do this? Okay, the, I want to change slightly from automating creation, which is, is 
honestly not that big a problem or threat or issue, to optimizing, which is already taking over all thinking in the creative arts. And it is a real, real problem. Uh, the word optimizing, technically speaking, means to make as perfect, effective, or functional as possible. It's a, it's a tech word. It's a, it, is a, it is a concept. It's a word that began living in the 1950s and then arced straight up, if you look at the chart, of the use of the word optimizing. Um, and now is, it's used a lot, and it is used seriously. People care about this because it seems like the goal. Just like in the period before then, in the Industrial Revolution, one of the things that was, um, was talked about was efficiency, um, which is actually in many ways related. Um, anyway, the, the point about this is optimizing has become the new way to judge art. Is it can we optimize this creative um, thing? Now, the way to understand this maybe better would be um, the, the, the book and movie Moneyball. Um, Michael Davis wrote this book about a particular um, coach for a particular baseball team um, who realized that he could analyze the statistics, uh, use the data, in order to pick players who, even though they don't seem like stars, or they don't see they're, they are they will over time or under certain circumstances be more valuable than people recognized because the data showed that they hit a certain way, a uh, certain amount, um, or caught a certain amount, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so therefore, this concept of Moneyball, which by the way, it's a terrific movie um, uh, with an interesting history. Um, because um, it was based on the book. It's not an easy book to, to movieize, to dramatize, and they did a phenomenal job. Um, and, and so you should check out that movie if you want to get the basic concept of, of Moneyball. But basically, it's, it's the idea of taking, and, and now Moneyballing has become uh, absolutely a commonplace concept in world society, and that includes the entertainment and the arts. So we're talking about optimizing, which is saying, I am going to use data. I am going to study this in terms of the data provided and using data, not using feelings or, or uh, all sorts of um, uncertain ways to judge things. I am going to use data. And we've all heard that so much in the past five, 10 years. Um, and in fact, one of the things that's very scary is there is more and more data-driven writing advice online. Like, uh, uh, I, I just pulled a couple of, of uh, just, if you go on, on your search engine and you, and you type in like data-driven creative writing or data-driven writing advice, there's one that was, uh, let me just, I'm going to read it out loud, um, a guy named Stephen Follows. Defining the average screenplay by getting data on 12,000 scripts. They looked at 12,300 feature scripts, tried to figure out the number of pages, the level of swearing, the gender-skewed genres, the number of speaking characters. In other words, um, but once again, it defines the average screenplay. I don't know how many of us are out setting out to write the average screenplay. Um, but... Um, there, there are the, the 538, a website, um, how data can help you write a better screenplay. Um, in other words, they are saying, we are going to look at a lot of screenplays. Ah, the highest scoring genre uh, is film noir. Gangsters, war, period dramas are second, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, the point about this is that a lot of people are taking seriously the concept, the money ball concept, when it comes to screenwriting in particular, because the, um, the, the, the stakes are so high and because people just love the idea of, of finding some way to formulaize this thing because it is a business more than an art, in fact. Um, business is driving the decisions more than art. Um, so uh, all I can say about this is it is, it is a pleasure it's a joy to to tear the hell out of this concept. It does not work. You cannot use data to create art. 
Um, you cannot use data to judge art. It will not work. Um, oh, even in a business sense, it doesn't work, um, but certainly in a creative sense, it doesn't work. Paul Reiser, who was on a sitcom for many, many years called Mad About You, and he was on an interview and he talked about the problem with executives wanting to apply data to the sitcom, where the laughs are, et cetera, et cetera, so that they could cut the lowest rated scene. In other words, if there's a scene that's getting less laughs than all the others, you're doing a comedy, you should cut that la that scene out. Just like on principle, that's optimizing. That is the exact principle of optimizing, um, which is get the data. Where are the laughs coming? Or sometimes the, the data is the audience will have a little knob and they will turn up or down the, um, the, the knob. I'm happy, I'm not, I'm liking it, I'm not liking it. Um, and so you can chart when they are or are not liking every line of a movie. Um, this is a bad plan. <laughs> it's not how you create art, and it's not even how you create uh, like popular art. Um, the, the, the point, Paul Reiser's point was though, okay, so if you, if you were to judge the laughs of a run-through of a, of a show, and the, show, the scene that got the least laughs you cut, well now, whatever, there's going to be the next lowest scene, now that's the lowest scene, in theory you should cut that too. At what point do you say, well, we're trying to optimize, so you want to get rid of the, the worst thing. So <laughs> that's eventually, you know, in, in making shoes, you would say, okay, what's the, the most useful, best-selling shoe? I'm not going to make these other shoes. But, but in a story, you can't take out scenes because they're not highly rated. It, it, first of all, the story will literally fall apart. But second of all, you would end up with just one scene. It would be the best scene in theory, but in fact, that obviously wouldn't work because this, the scene wouldn't exist. The scene wouldn't have a story to back it up. So that's where one of the main problems with data applying money ball, applying optimization to creative arts is that most of the principles applied, they just don't work that way. You can't have everything operating at the same level all the time. Now, obviously you could in theory figure out a rhythm that said, okay, of the 200 most popular movies, they all had a, a high point of, of activity at this this. 12 minute point and they all had a sad moment at now first of all they won't all have that but even if you start to average and said the the most popular works of art had this in common um now here's the point is that that had that theory existed a long time before uh data it happened that people would say, well, let's look at the great things of the past and essentially imitate them. Uh, if they had, you know, whatever it was that people decided were the great things of the past, they would say, if we do that, this will be great, which never, ever worked. <laughs> never. If you look at all the stuff that was done in compliance with other artwork, it always, almost always fails. And let's say I've brought something new to it. Once you bring something new to it, you're breaking the plan. The, the actual creative value is a mixture of taking old things and bringing something new, taking group things and bringing something individual. That's the whole purpose, the whole method of creativity. Um, let me just quickly go through some. Uh, all right. Um, interactive games are based on players' reaction. Um, that, that's, that, that's true, although in theory you could come up with interactive art, and it's not a bad idea. Um, imagine how much worse things like test audience screens could become with AI optimization. I guarantee you they are already doing that. And yeah, it will not work. Data is past tense, is it? <laughs> um, okay. Uh, you are entirely welcome, Je Gregory. Um, the best side of money ballization has always been its ability to find diamonds in the rough. Yes. Um, I wonder if it could undervalued. This is an interesting, this is a great question, Kitchy. Here's the thing. What, what the Moneyball ability to recognize the value of things outside of it was, was not about the data 
finding value. It was about the data removing prejudices. In other words, people were saying, this person is great because of X, Y, and Z. There was a common um, set of beliefs. What the, the data uh, issue did was open up the possibility that there's other ways to judge. However, if you only judge, and this is one of the things I want to talk about about art, if you only judge by data, there are things that data cannot measure. So therefore, you will sooner or later blend out in your, the diamonds, those particular diamonds in the rough may be advanced, but other diamonds in the rough will be lost because data can't recognize all qualities of art. Um, yeah, don't worry, you will see this. I guarantee you, you will see it fairly soon. Um, if the end product sucks, the method will be discarded because it wastes money. Exactly. And, and, I, and I do believe that that is the thing why you don't have to worry about uh, automating. The thing is that you do have to worry about optimizing because they can't tell that that's the cause of the failure. They believe, like, honestly, let's, let's talk about this. Um, the, the main thing is that in working from data, you have to uh, set a data value. And this is where art and data have a problem because art does not have a set amount of values. Like you can decide who hits the most hits and in baseball that will be valuable. But in art, you can't just simply decide by box office. The history of, of, of art has been that when people try to estimate what the best new art will be by looking at what was popular or financially successful or re highly regarded by the past, it does not allow for the thing that art requires, which is new creation, original thought, things that were not checked by the data. So therefore, um, the, the thing that art has is has values which are not data values. Um, the, the, the values... You, there is no data for a lot of art. There is a, for a lot of what art does for people. So just as art can't be created through data, art also can't be judged through data because um, you, you, you're going to find that, like you can say, what gets the biggest screams in the audience? Or you can say, who buys the most tickets? Those things are not all often created by the actual art itself. The things that make more money often are the things that are on more screens or the things that has more publicity or the thing that happens to be a fad, okay? That does not mean that thing is inherently valuable. Um, so this is going to be the biggest issue of our time is, is the idea of data becoming the way that we judge. Um, in the old days, there was there was theory that if it was old, if it was classical, if it had stayed, if it had lasted through time. In other words, there were only a few stories and authors whose works succeeded past their time. They were taught in classes at, long after the author's death. People began to believe that means they're inherently good. It was not actually the truth. The thing is that there were a lot of reasons why one author was picked up over others, um, but. But for a long time, everyone said, therefore, Shakespeare and Dickens and Dante, those define good. Um, but of course, art moved on and they're no longer there's, there's good stuff in them, of course, but it's not the actual defining data. Likewise, success. Um, one of the problems is you have to figure out what you define success as. Um, and one of the main problems is art is unique personal expression, almost always, um, even if the artist is anonymous, even if the, if in the sense of a cathedral, okay, famously, cathedrals were built over such a long period of time by so many craftsmen and artists, you could essentially say there was no creator of a cathedral back from the Middle Ages. Um, First of all, that's not entirely true, but, but my point, once again, somebody laid out the initial design for that cathedral. And all the other artists are contributing to that, but there was essentially an author or group of, of people who authored that. Um, can that unique personal expression be of a group? Absolutely. Can it be collaborative? Yes. Can it be corporate? Yes. It is possible for a corporation 
<laughs> to hire people who come together in committees and work out a really, really great work of art. I would argue that Pixar and Marvel have done that, and, and those are some great works of art. Um, I, I am not saying that technology is bad. I'm saying that art values may be more complex, just like human brains are more complex. Um, I did meant <laughs> I was at a film festival once and I got into a conversation uh, at a party with a guy who worked for one of the coverage services. Um, they were sponsoring the event. So this guy was there. He had his little tag from the company. I'm not going to say the company name because it doesn't matter. It was a data driven company that was like, we are going to create a service where people average out there, like they vote up, they vote this up and down, and therefore the up votes and down votes will, will tell you whether your work is good. Um, and he, he was talking about the technology in which you can, data-driven, decide whether a screenplay is good or bad. And I asked him, I said, well, what do you mean by good? I mean, I don't know. Like, he was like, well, we definitely can figure out through data what, what's, what's good. Uh, and what's bad? And I was like, I don't understand how you're defining good. And and the thing is that this person was simply defining good by popularity and financial success. It was just that simple. The, the popularity could mean artistic regard or it could mean lots of people liking it. But the point is, those measures are not actual artistic values. Um, y different people will like different things. And you can't say, ah, this is objectively better. That that does not actually make sense. You can say this is objectively more popular at this moment. However, we have seen Van Gogh and Herman Melville uh, were objectively not popular at the time of their life and became classics later. Um, so what is that? Did they become better? <laughs> you know, the, the popularity or financial reward of art does not guarantee it is good. Um, it doesn't say it's bad either. It just says that that's not how you judge artistic value because just like the creation of art is a unique individual experience, the experience of art is a unique individual experience. Um, okay, let me just quickly check some of the... Uh, does data determine how to end a movie? For some people, yeah, but it's it's not going to work very well. But yes, in theory, you could you could data derive if you chose to figure out an algorithm that says movies that we consider successful. How did they all end and find a? But once again, you're finding an average. No particular movie defines that, and some would be great outside of that data, and that's the problem. Um, let's see what kind of movie. Oh, we, we talked about this. Um, between Disney's decision by committee and computerized data, I just, yeah, um, there's a lot of there's a lot of worthwhile collaborative committee art. Um, yes, exactly. That's why Scouts adopted and incorporated money, but it's not just that. And I would agree with that. And I believe that tech is interesting in that way. Um, there are games that create events. It's up to the player to find the story in that. That's interesting. Um, uh, that's that's a, a separate question from from where we've moved on to. But yes, um, Nielsen does still exist. Yes, there are still ratings. Um, I can't come up with a beginning. Hi, Bilal. Um, I start with the flow. Um, let me get to that in just a second. I want to I want to get to the end of this, um, which is uh, when you start to look at data um, as a um, as a deciding factor on values of art, it reminds me a lot of social Darwinism. There was a time, 100 or so years ago, when uh, Darwin's scientific discoveries about evolution became a defense for social inequality and racism. Because what people said was, well, if the theory, the scientific understanding was the success of the fittest. So therefore, if you were succeeding, you were better. <laughs> Therefore, if you were not succeeding, you were worse. So they, it was a basic misunderstanding of the science. Okay, I believe that is what's happening now with optimization of art. Um, it's a basic misunderstanding, like applying a piece of scientific process to a thing that it does not apply to or that there are other elements involved. Um, so 
um, there are many ways to judge art. Um, uh, there, there was a period, uh, like centuries of centuries in, in Western Europe, when all art was the purpose of art, the function of art was not to be an expression of your soul, but to be an expression of, of the greatness of God. Um, there's also a group of people who truly believe that the use of art is to be useful to people. In other words, that art should show you how to do things the right way. Um, very often in, in many societies, you get art which is judged by a group of people, often not even recognizing that they are an elite, but just saying, if this is accepted as good among this group, that determines what is good or bad. Um, and, and of course, we all know the politics and, and, um, and prejudices that in, get involved by that, but it's usually the way that art has been judged for the past four or five hundred years. Um, in the past hundred or so years, profitability and popularity have, have become weirdly... Um, people seem to not recognize that those are chosen ways to judge art. Um, art itself is not, is not actually being judged by that. It's just the set of values. Excuse me. And that's what I wanted to get to is art is, does not have an objective set of values. Um, and um, I, I run into a lot of arguments now with people who literally don't understand the concept that pop, if something could be popular, it may not be good. Um, obviously, a lot of people like it. Well, if it's popular, it's probably bad. But but many, many people in this world have now um, come to absorb a worldview in which if something is getting popular, and now that is often registered uh, in terms of clicks or likes or whatever, therefore it must be good, which is popular and good are different. The, the meaning of good art is adaptable and flexible between different people. Um, all right. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay. Um, eugenics, indeed. Yes. <laughs> the problem with social Darwinism is it leads to murder. Um, <laughs> it leads to eugenics. Yeah. Um, interactive choose your own adventure movies. Um, yeah, absolutely. It, and, and what's more, that is a legitimate art form and it's, it's challenging many of my values because in my values, art would, uh, not leave open ended questions. Um, but, but what I've had to accept is, well, that's only one kind of art. There is art that would be uh, cr created in collaboration with uh, the, the users. Um, oh, good. I'm glad. Hi, Blaine. Um, yeah, multiplayer games or, or um, multi-story possibility games are fascinating. Um, horror films make money, Westerns are financial. The data shows that now. Um, there were other times when horror films really were not that popular. Um, do the ways to judge art either good or bad cycle? Um, they they come and go. I don't know that they cycle and that they return, but I do believe that they rise and fall. Um, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so I, I just want to get to a couple of basic thoughts that I'm going to answer the last question, and then we are going to be stopping because I got some stuff to do. Um, but but the the... The thing is that the, the human brain and the human spirit, whether or not you believe we are empirically limited to brain cells or if there is more to us, is more complex than at least our current understanding of data uh, can, can comprehend. And there, you cannot actually, just like you cannot AI a person, you, the AI, you cannot automate a person, you cannot automate art, I, I, is my opinion. Um, I'm sure that there are people who are saying, A, you can, and B, you're just not seeing that it's going to happen. And that is possible. I, I will not deny. In theory, if AI could become human, sentient, unique, individual, um, and all the things that make a human a human, then yes, absolutely. Then AI could be great artists. I, I absolutely am not denying that possibility. I'm saying that so far we have not reached anything remotely like that. And until then, um, what we're getting is, is business hoping to find a way, as they always have, to manage 
a process which is essentially unbusinesslike. <laughs> and and whether they were doing that by saying, let's make another movie like the last one that was successful, which is exactly the same thing, or if they're saying that we can you know, get a computer to, to granularly analyze stories and tell you what the right one is, that is inherently unartistic. It is inherently going to create bad art. Um, it may not create unpopular art. And it, the thing is, a lot of times, just like, you know, uh, pictures made by a computer can become, they can be pleasing to the eye and they can become um, uh, popular. They can become the, the novelty, the fad. I, I guarantee you, if, if a movie is written by an AI, they will be able to sell that simply on the curiosity value, the freak show value of that. And then people will go to see it. The problem becomes, for instance, is a sunset art. If the thing that created it is not intending to uh, express or communicate um, anything, is that art? And I would say no. I would say that a sunset, while created by many factors and unique and, and, and gorgeous, is not a work of art. It's another thing. It's a beautiful phenomenon. But it is not art. Um, art, I believe, requires either communication, in other words, it's from one being to another, and at the present, AI is not uh, a being, and optimizing software is not a being, so therefore can't judge the communication. And also, there has to be some, and this is an or, the intention or expression, or meaning, like maybe there is art that is meaningless, however, it's still an expression of something. Um, there is some intention there. I do not say that all art has to be meaningful. I, do not, uh, I recognize that that's, that's not necessarily true. But there is some individuality. There is some uniqueness, something unique to the creation and reception, which is, um, for lack of a better word, uh, to do with the soul, the spirit, the, 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 uh, the human being. Um, and, and I am going to uh, take my stand, <laughs> willing to fight about it, um, that once you, when you remove that portion, it, you cannot adequately create or judge art. Um, okay, got to quickly do some, some, some uh, notes here. Hi, Mythical, thank you. Um, AI can be too predictable, but that'll probably get better. That's, that's like saying, uh, you know, video is never going to have a good image. And sooner or later, the technology will get good enough that, that video is gorgeous. Um, judging art is going to be contingent. Yes, based on contextual critique. Yes, exactly, 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 Gregory, you and I agree. Um, yes, absolutely. <laughs> no, it's true. It's the biggest problem. It, like I said, you know, hello, Skynet. Um, okay, life imitates art. Um, to a certain extent, and often vice versa. Um, thank you, Ray. Uh, I am very, very glad. Um, okay. Okay. Thank you, Doug. Um, all right. So let me briefly, briefly go back to Bilal's question, and then I'm going to be signing off. Um, okay. Can't come up with a beginning. Started with an idea of the flow of the middle and end, but I can't come up with a first scene that leads to it. Starting from the first... Ah, okay. This is interesting. Because um, because Bilal, you kind of, uh, this is true, all of you, if I'm not around, <laughs> look at your question. You almost always will tell, give yourself the answer in it. Okay, you're saying writing from the screen always makes me draw a blank. Don't. Start at the second scene. What if you write the first scene last? What If you have great ideas for the middle and end, write that part. Do the best you can. Don't worry about the beginning. If you get everything else good, your mind will then have more to work with to build the, the, the beginning out of it, because there will be things that you need to establish, and then you will take each piece on in a piece-by-piece -piece basis. That's the thing. The first scene has got to accomplish something, and so you will eventually get to, well, what do I need to accomplish here? I need to accomplish meeting the setting, meeting the main character, establishing the threat, whatever it is. You're, there's many possible ways to start. Then you're going to say, well, I need a scene that tells me why it's a problem or whatever it is. 
don't worry. But what you're saying is you're not saying that you can't come up with the beginning. You're saying that you're having a problem with doing the first scene first. Don't start from the first scene. If starting from the first scene makes you draw a blank, don't do it. Do the other thing and you can always go back to it. This is a really valuable lesson. I'm going to happily end on this. Um, if you've got a thing that you're not able to do when you're writing, just do the other things. If all you need to do is write the ending, just then write the ending first. It, there's no rule that says you have to write in order. There's no rule that says you have to do any of this stuff in any particular way. If you keep working at the process and do the things you can do, event like if you for some reason you can't write an outline, but you can write a scene, write the scene. Then maybe later you'll make an outline. Um, whatever it is that you can do, do that because sooner or later you will have to do all the other things and you'll have more material to work with uh, on them. So the answer is if you find yourself stuck at some part, take step away from that thing, that process, part of the process, and do the others. If you can think of a great plot but no characters, get your plot in order, and then you'll have to go back and ask questions. It is always going to be a process of questions, and this is a video I did, so you can watch it. Ask questions, and also use what you have. Okay, look at those two videos. I believe you will find a lot of useful steps that will help you to get around this problem. And that is that. Okay, thank you, Kestrel. Good to see you. Um, thank you, Morbo. Thank you, Gregory. Uh, <laughs> wrote his, uh, Corman wrote his first sold script in reverse order. Yeah, exactly. Get the end scene first. There's Whatever works is fine. There is no right way to do art. The way you have to do it is the way that you can do it, the way that works for you. And remember that if you keep going back through it, you will eventually do all the other things, including the things that you don't do well. Not You don't have to do everything well. That's okay. Don't start with the start. Yeah, start midway through. Okay, start in the second act. Exactly. Um, I don't currently have one. I will, I will be talking about that. Um, okay, good, 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 good. Uh, thank you. You all have a good one too. I gotta go. I'm running late. I got I got my life going on out here. Um, so in the meantime, I will see you on Thursday at one o'clock. I will be actually talking about writing my novel. <sighs> go write something.